Tides of Darkness, Chapter 3 Khadgar watched quietly from one side of the room. Lothar had wanted him present, both as a witness, and Khadgar suspected, as a familiar face in this strange land, and Khadgar's own curiosity had compelled him to accept the invitation. But he knew better than to present himself to these men as an equal, despite the power he now wielded personally. Every one of them was a ruler, and capable of having him killed in seconds. Besides, Khadgar felt he had been in the center of things too much of late. As a youth, he had been more accustomed to watching and waiting and studying before he acted. It was nice to return to old habits again, if only for the moment. He recognized many of the men present, at least by description. The large, bearish man with the thick features, the heavy black beard, and the black and gray armor was Gen Greymane. He ruled the southern nation of Gilneas, and Khadgar had heard he was far more clever than his appearance suggested. The tall, slender man, with the weathered skin and the green naval uniform, was of course Admiral Dalin Proudmoore. He ruled Kul Tiers, but it was his position as commander of the world's largest, fiercest navy that made even Tiernus treat him as an equal. The quiet, cultured-looking man, with the graying brown hair and hazel eyes, was Lord Aidan Perinald, master of Ultorak. He was glaring at Thoris Trollbane, king of neighboring Stormguard. But the tall, gruff Trollbane was ignoring him, his leathers and furs apparently shielding him as well from the Perinald's anger as they did from his mountain's home's fierce weather. Instead, Trollbane's craggy features were turned toward a short, stout man with a snow-white beard and a friendly face. He needed no introduction anywhere on the continent, even without his ceremonial robes and staff. Alonsus Feo was the Archbishop of the Church of Light, and revered by humans everywhere. Khadgar could see why. He had never met Fayal himself, but just watching him created a sense of peace and wisdom. A violet flicker from the corner of his eye distracted Khadgar, and he turned and struggled not to gape. Striding into the throne room was a legend, tall and cadaverously thin, with a long, grey-streaked brown beard and moustache and matching bushy eyebrows, his bald head covered by a gold-edged skull cap was the Archmage Antonidas. In all his years in Deleron, Khadgar had seen the Kirin Tor leader only twice, once in passing, and once when they informed Khadgar they were sending him to Medivh, to see the Master Wizard now, openly taking his place beside the other rulers, looking every inch as regal as any monarch, filled Khadgar with awe and a surprising wave of homesickness. He missed Deleron, and found himself wondering if he would ever be able to return to the Wizard City, perhaps after the wars were over assuming they would survive. Antonidas had been the last to arrive, and when he reached the area, just before the dais, Tyrannus stood and clapped his hands. The sound reverberated, and conversations died away, as everyone turned their attention toward their royal host. Thank you all for coming, Tyrannus began, his voice carrying easily across the room. I know the request seems sudden, but we have matters of grave import to discuss, and time seems to be of the essence. He paused, then turned to the man standing on the dais beside him. I present to you Anduin Lothar, champion of Stormwind. He has come here as a messenger and more, perhaps a savior. I think it best if I let him tell you himself what he has seen and what we may expect soon ourselves. Lothar stepped forward. Tyrannus had provided him with fresh clothing, of course, but Lothar had insisted on keeping his armor rather than trading it for undamaged Lordaeron gear. His great sword still rose above one shoulder, a fact Khadgar was sure many of the monarchs had noticed. But it was the champion's face and words that caught their attention right from the start. For once, Lothar's inability to hide his emotions worked to his advantage, letting the assembled king see the truth in his words. Your Majesty, Lothar began, I thank you for attending this meeting and for listening to what I have to say. I am no poet or diplomat, but I am warrior so I will keep my words brief and blunt. He took a deep breath. I must tell you that my home, Stormwind, is no more. Several of the monarchs gasped. Others paled. It fell before a horde of creatures known as orcs, Lothar explained. They are terrible foe, as tall as a man and far stronger, with bestial features, green skin and red eyes. This time no one laughed. This horde appeared recently and began harassing our patrol, Lothar continued. But those were just their raiding parties. When their full force marched, we were astounded. They literally had thousands, tens of thousands, of warriors, enough to cover the land like a foul shadow. And they were implacable foes, strong and cruel and merciless. He sighed. 
We fought them as best we could, but it was not enough. They besieged our city after wreaking havoc across the land itself. And though we held them back for a time, they finally breached our defenses. King Lane died at their hands. Gadgar noticed Lothar did not say how. Perhaps mentioning the half-orc assassin that had trusted as a scout and ally would weaken his recounting. Or perhaps Lothar simply did not want to think about it. Gadgar could understand that. He didn't want to dwell on the matter either. He had considered Corona a friend and had been saddened by her betrayal, even though he had been with her when they saw a vision of it back in Medivh's tower. As did most of our nobles, Lothar was continuing. I was charged with seeing his son and as many people to safety as possible, and with warning the rest of the world what happened. For this horde is not native to our land, not even to our work. They will not be content in controlling a single continent. They will want the rest of the world as well. You are saying they're coming here, Proudmoor comment. More statement than a question, when Lothar paused. Yes. Lothar's simple response sent a ripple of surprise, and perhaps fear through the room. But Proudmoor nodded. Do they have ships? He asked. I do not know, Lothar replied. We had not seen any before now, but then we had not seen the Horde itself until the past year, he found. And if they did not have ships before, they certainly have them now. They raided all along our coastline. And while they sank many vessels, others are simply missing. We can assume, then, that they have the means to cross the ocean. Proudmoor did not look surprised by this, and Cadgar guessed the Admiral had already assumed the worst. They could be sailing towards us even now. They can march over land as well, Trollbane growled. Don't forget that. Aye, they can indeed, Lothar agreed. We first encountered them to the east, near the Swamp of Sorrows, and they crossed all Azeroth to reach Stormwind. If they can turn north, they can cross the burning steppes and the mountains and come upon Lordaeron from the south. The south? That was Gain Greymane. They shall not pass us. I will crush any who attempt landfall on my southern coast. You do not understand. Lothar looked and sounded weary. You have not faced them, and so their numbers and strength are difficult to comprehend. But I tell you now, you cannot stand against them. He faced the ensembled monarch's pride and grief clear on his face. Stormwind's armies were great. He assured them softly. My warriors were trained and seasoned. We had faced the orcs before and defeated them. But that was merely their vanguard. Before the horde itself, we fell like eight old children, like old men, like weak. His voice was flat, his words carrying a ring of grim certainty. They will sweep across the mountains and across your lands and across you. And what do you propose we do, then? That was Archbishop Fayal and his calm voice soothed the tempest Cadgar saw ready to erupt. No one liked being called a fool, especially a king, and especially not in front of his peers. We need to band together, Lothar insisted. None of you alone can withstand them, but all of us together might. You say this threat is coming, I would not dispute it, Perinald commented, his smooth voice cutting across the other kings. And you say we must band together to end the threat, yet I wonder... Have you tried other methods to resolve the matter? Surely these orcs are rational beings. Surely they have some goal in mind. Perhaps we can negotiate with them. Lothar shook his head, his pained expression showing just how foolish he found this discussion. They want this world, our world, he answered slowly, as if talking to a child. They will not settle for less. We did send messengers, envoys, ambassadors. He smiled, a grim Hard smile. Most of them came back in pieces. If they came back at all. Cadgar saw several of the kings murmuring to each other, and from their tone, suspected they still did not understand the danger they all faced. He sighed and began to step forward, wondering, even as he did, why they would listen to him any more than they had to Lothar. Yet he had to try. Fortunately, another moved forward as well, and though he also wore robes rather than armor, this new figure carried more authority by far. Hear me, Antonidas cried, his voice thin but still powerful. He raised his carved staff high, and light burst from its tip, dazzling the other men. Hear me, he demanded again, and this time all turned and quiet to listen. I have received reports. Before now, this new menace, the Archmage admitted. The wizards of Azeroth were first intrigued, and then terrified by the orgs, and sent many letters with information and request for aid, he frowned. I fear we did not listen as well as we might have. We appreciated their danger, but thought the orcs little more than a local nuisance confined to that continent. It seems we were wrong, but I tell you, 
that they are dangerous. Many, I respect, have confirmed this. We disregard the champion's words at our own peril. If they are so dangerous, why did the wizards there not deal with them? Greymane demanded. Why did they not use their magic to end the threat? Because the orcs possess magic of their own, Antonidas countered. Potent magic. Most of their warlocks are weaker than our own wizards, at least from what my fellows reported. Yet they have far greater numbers, and can work in unison, something my own brethren have never found easy. Khadgar was sure he heard some bitterness in the old archmage's voice, and understood it well. If there was one thing every member of the Kirin Tor valued, it was his independence. Getting even two wizards to work together was difficult enough. The thought of managing more than that was almost beyond imagining. Our wizards did fight back, Lothar explained. They helped turn the tide of several battles, but the Archmage is correct. We lacked the numbers to stand against them, magically as well as physically. For every orc spellcaster killed, another rose to take his place, and two more beside him. And they traveled with raiding parties, and smaller armies to protect them from more mundane dangers. Lending their magic to increase the power of the warriors around them, he frowned. Our greatest wizard, Medivh, fell to the Horde's darkness. Most of our other wizards were lost as well. I do not think magic alone will turn them back. Khadgar noticed that Lothar did not mention how or why Medivh had died, and appreciated the warrior's tact. This was not the place for such revelations. He did not miss the sharp glance Antonidas directed his way, however, and suppressed a sigh. At some point soon, the ruling council of the Kirin Tor would demand a full explanation. Khadgar knew they would not be satisfied with less than the truth, and he suspected withholding anything could prove deadly to them all, since it tied so closely to the Hold's presence and early activities. I find it strange, Paranal's soft purr cut through the conversation again, that our stranger to our shores should be so concerned for our survival. He glanced at Lothar with what looked suspiciously like a smack, and Kadgar resisted the urge to set the oily king's beard alight. Forgive me for treading upon fresh wounds, sir, but your own kingdom is gone. Your king is dead, and your prince little more than a boy. Your land's overrun. Is that not so? Lothar nodded, grinding his teeth, presumably to keep from snapping the arrogant king's head off. You have brought word of this threat to us, for which we are grateful. Yet you speak repeatedly of what we must do, how we must unite. He made a great show of looking around the chamber. Varian was not there. Tyrannus had taken him in, treating the still-shaken prince as a member of his own household. And both he and Lothar had agreed that the boy should not have to deal with additional scrutiny right now. I do not see anyone else from your kingdom here. And you have said yourself that the prince is but a boy, and the lands a conquered territory. If we were to consider your suggestion and unite, what could you possibly add to the assembly, beyond your own martial prowess, of course? Lothar opened his mouth to respond, very evident in every feature, but he was cut off again by King Tyrannus, surprisingly enough. I will not have my guests insulted so, Lord Ron's ruler announced the steel plain in his voice. He has brought us this news as great personal peril, and show nothing more but honor and compassion, despite his own personal grief. Perinald nodded, and half bowed, a silent, if mocking, apology. Further, you are wrong to think him alone or invaluable, Tyrannus continued. Prince Varian Wern is now my honored guest, and will be so until such a time as he chooses to depart. I have pledged myself to aiding him in regaining his kingdom. Several of the other monarchs murmured at that, and Khadgar knew what they were thinking. Tyrannus had just announced any claims he might make to Stormwind and warned the other kings that Varian had his support. All in a single statement. It was a clever move, and his respect for Lordaeron's king rose still higher. Sir Lothar has brought with him others from his kingdom, Tyrannus continued, including some soldiers while their numbers are not significant when compared to the threat we face. Their experience in dealing with the orcs firsthand could be invaluable. Many more still wonder what was Stormwind, confused and unguided. 
This may rally upon hearing their champion's call, giving us additional numbers. Lothar himself is a seasoned commander and a tactician, and I have nothing but the utmost respect for his personal abilities. He paused and glanced at Lothar in what looked curiously like a question. Khadgar was intrigued to see his companion not. The champion and the king had met several times while waiting for the other monarchs to arrive, and Khadgar had not been privy to all their discussions, but now he wondered what exactly he had missed. Finally, there is the question of his being a stranger. Tyrannus smiled. Though Lothar himself has not graced his continent with his presence before now, he is far from a stranger, for he has strong ties to this land and to our own kingdoms, for he is of the Arathi bloodline, indeed the last of their noble line, and thus he has much right to speak at this council as any of us. The revelation caused a stir among the other kings, and Khadgar also looked at his companion with new eyes, and Arathi. He had heard of Arathor, of course, as had everyone in Lordaeron. It had been the first nation on the continent, long ago, and the people there had formed strong ties with the elves. Together the two races had fought against a massive troll army at the foot of Alteric Mountains, and together the two races broke the troll threat and shattered the troll nation forever. The Erethorian Empire had prospered and expanded before finally, years later, collapsing into the smaller nations that covered the continent today. The Erethor capital, Strom, had been abandoned for the lusher northern lands, and the last of the Arathi had disappeared. Some stories claim they had gone south, past Kars Modan, into the wilderness of Azeroth. Strom had become the center of Stromgard, Trollbane's domain. It is true, Lothar announced in ringing tones, his eyes daring any man to call him a liar. I descended from King Thoradin, the founder of Arathor. My family settled in Azeroth after the Empire collapsed and founded a new nation there, which became known as Stormwind. So you have come to claim sovereignty over us? Greymane demanded, though his face showed he did not believe it. No, Lothar assured him. Many ancestors surrounded any claim upon Lordaeron long ago, when they chose to depart. But I still have ties to this land, which my people helped conquer and civilize. And he can still call upon ancient packs for aid, Tyrannus pointed out. The elves swore to support Thoradin and his lines in times of need. They will still honor that commitment. That drew appreciative glances and whispers from several, and Cadgar nodded. Suddenly Lothar was more than just a warrior, or even a commander in their eyes. Now he was a potential ambassador to the elves. And if that ancient magic-wielding race chose to ally with them, suddenly the horde did not seem nearly as unstoppable. This is a great deal to take in. Paranold commented dryly. Perhaps we should give ourselves time to consider all we have heard, and all that must be done to protect our lands from this new threat. Agreed, Tyrannus said, not even bothering to ask the others their opinion. Food has been set out in the dining hall, and I invite all of you to join me, not as kings, but as neighbors and friends. Let us not discuss this matter over our food but mull it to ourselves, that we may approach it more clearly after we have digested both the food and the danger that lay before us. Gadgar shook his head as the monarchs nodded and began moving toward the door. Paranon was a wily one, that was certain. He had seen that his fellow ruler's support was swinging toward Lothar, and had found a way to regroup. Gadgar suspected the Alteric king would announce after lunch that he had reconsidered, and that clearly Lothar's idea had merit. That way, he could avoid losing face or being forced into a junior position in the upcoming alliance, which it seemed the kings would likely agree upon soon. As he followed the monarchs from the room, Khadgar noticed a movement above and off to one side. Turning, he caught a brief glimpse of two heads peeking out from one of the upper balconies. One was dark-haired and solemn, and he recognized Prince Varian. Of course, the Stormwind heir would want to know what took place in this meeting. The second head was fair-haired, and younger, a mere boy, standing back far enough that Varian probably did not realize he had a shadow. The boy saw him looking and grinned before disappearing behind the balcony's back curtain. So Khadgar thought to himself, young Prince Arthas also wants to know what his father and others are planning. And why not? All Lordaeron would be his one day, provided that they could keep the horde from overrunning it. End 
of Chapter 3. Chapter 4 Doomhammer was speaking with one of his lieutenants, Ren Blackhand, of the Blacktooth Green Clan, when a scout came running up. Though the Orc warrior clearly had news to import, he stopped several paces from them and waited, catching his breath, until Doomhammer glanced in his direction and nodded. Trolls! The Orc scout announced, still gasping. Forest trolls! A full war party! By the looks of it, trolls! Ren laughed. What? Are they attacking us? I thought they were smarter than ogres, not dumber. Doomham had to agree. The one time he had encountered forest trolls, he had been impressed and a little disquieted by their cunning. Though the trolls were taller than the orcs, they were leaner and more agile, particularly in the forest, which made them a significant threat within such places. Crossing the waters to reach this island, however, did not match what he had seen of their behavior. But the scout was shaking his head. Not attacking! They're on the mainland, and they've been captured, he grinned, by humans. That got Doomhammer's attention. Where? he demanded. Not far from the shore, along the hills just within the forest, the scout answered promptly. They were marching west, though it was a slow going for them. How many? Close to forty humans, the scout replied. Ten trolls. Doomhammer nodded and turned back to Ren. Gather your strongest warriors, he instructed. And quickly, you leave at once. He glowered at the black-toothed grin leader. Be clear, however, he warned, that this is a raiding party only. You are to rescue the trolls and bring them back here with you. Avoid being seen as much as possible and kill any who do spy you. I will not have our battle plans ruined because you are careless. The chieftain nodded and departed without a word, moving quickly toward a warrior lounging nearby. Rand began barking orders, even before he had reached the other orc, and the warrior quickly straightened, nodded, and ran off, no doubt seeking his fellows. Doomham awaited impatiently, signaling the scout to wait as well. His hands flexed in anticipation, but his mind was far away, back many months to his previous encounter with the trolls. Blackhand had shocked the other orc clans, back on their homeworld, by declaring his intent to ally with the ogres. It had proven a useful partnership, the monstrous creature lending considerable strength to their horde, but it still went against the grain. Thus, many had been skeptical when they had heard reports of the similar creatures here on this new, lush world, and Blackhand had announced they would win these creatures to their war banner as well. He had sent Doomhammer and a handful of other Blackrock warriors to make contact, a sign of the trust he placed in his young second. Even now, Doomhammer felt guilty about that, for he had betrayed his war chief's trust and turned on him, killing him and taking his place as leader. Still, it was the way of the clans, and Black Hand had been leading their people to their own death and destruction. Doomhammer had been forced to act in order to save them. He reached back and down, running his fingers along the smooth stone head of his hammer, where it hung across his back, the handle high over his shoulder, and the head down beside his thigh. Long ago, Shaman had prophesied that the mighty weapon would one day see the salvation of their people. They had also said, however, that the wielder who saved them would also doom them, and that would be the last of the Doomhammer line. Doomhammer had wondered about that many times, and even more since he had become war chief and leader of the Horde. Had his taking control meant their people's salvation? He certainly felt that to be the case, but did that mean he was also destined to doom them afterward, and that his line would end with him? He hoped not. At that time, however, Doomhammer had not been as concerned with such matters. He still trusted Black Hand. At least the orc leader's loyalty to their people and intent to see them masters of this world, and still followed the war chief's orders, though he did his best to moderate Black Hand's love of unnecessary violence. Not that Doomhammer shrank from combat, and as with most orc warriors, he delighted in the exertion and the thrill of battle. But there were times when too much force could actually reduce the value of a victory. This mission, however, had involved communication rather than warfare, and Doomhammer had been intrigued and honored and perhaps, deep down, even a little frightened. Thus far, they encountered only humans on this new world, and one or two of the diminutive but mighty creatures called dwarves. If this world had ogres, however, the Horde could find itself with a more powerful enemy than they had yet seen. It took two weeks before Doomhammer finally encountered a troll. He and his warriors wandered through the forest, where our scout had seen one, making no effort to conceal themselves. As the time passed, they had become more convinced the scout had lied, or simply been mistaken, jumping at shadows, 
and then concocting a story to cover his own cowardice. Then, one night, just as twilight stretched across the land and threw long shadows under the trees, a figure swung down from the branches high above, dropping silently to the ground just beyond the orc's campfire. Another appeared an instant later, then another, until the orcs found themselves surrounded by six of the silent, shadowy figures. At first, Doomhammer thought the scout had been correct, and they were facing ogres, though these were slightly smaller and moved with a silence, and a grace he had never seen the behemoths possess before. But then a ray of fading sunlight struck one of the creatures as it stalked forward, and Doomhammer saw that its skin was green, as green as its own, as green as the leaves on the trees. That explained why they had not noticed the creatures before. Their coloration allowed them to blend into the foliage, especially if they moved through the branches, as these evidently had. He also saw that the creature's was taller, leaner than an oak, and more proportioned, lacking the overlong arms and oversized hands and massive head of those creatures. And the look the approaching figure gave him, firelight glinting in its dark eyes, as it extended a spear to prod at Doomhammer, showed a certain intelligence as well. We are not your fools, Doomhammer shouted, his cry splitting the quiet night. He batted the spear aside with one hand, nodding as he did that. The head was chipped stone and looked very sharp. I seek your leader. A rumble came from the creatures then, and after an instant, Doomhammer realized it was laughter. What a be one then with our leader, Massa? The lead creature replied, its mouth splitting in a monstrous grin. They had tusks as well, Doomhammer saw, though longer and thicker than his own, and more blunt from the looks of them. He also noticed the creature's hair, which rose in a dark crest above its head. Surely that look was not natural, meaning these creatures groomed themselves. Definitely not mere beasts. Then, I would speak with him on behalf of my own leader, Doomhammer replied. He kept his hands at his side, open to show he carried no weapon, yet he was wary. He would be a fool not to be. That was fortunate, for the creature laughed again. We no be speaking with more, sirs, it replied. We be eating them, and it thrust its spear, no longer a question prod, but a hard, Swift motion that would have gutted Doomhammer as easily as he might have speared a fish if he had stood still for the blow. Instead, he twisted away, pulling his hammer free from his back and bellowed a war cry. The shout seemed to startle the creature, which paused in the act of withdrawing its weapon for a second attack. Doomhammer did not give it time to recover. He leaped forward, hammer swinging hard, and smashed one of the creature's legs full in the knee. The creature toppled with a howl of pain, clutching the shattered limb, and Doomhammer swung again and a mighty overhand blow that crushed the creature's skull. I say again, I seek your leader, he shouted, turning to face the other creatures, who did not move during the quick fight. Take me to him, or I shall kill the rest of you, and seek others more willing. He raised his hammer for emphasis, knowing from long experience the sight of its black stone head dripping with fresh blood and matted hair and bone was enough to unnerve most foes. The jester were. The other creatures backed away, a step raising their weapons high to show they were not attacking, and then one stepped around the others and approached him. This one's hair was braided rather than cut in a stiff crest, and it wore a necklace of bones around its neck. Y'all be wishing to speak with Zuljan, the creature asked. Doomhammer nodded, assuming that was either the name or the title of their leader. I be bringing them here, the creature offered. It turned away and disappeared into the shadows without a sound, leaving its four companions behind. They glanced at each other and at the orcs, clearly not sure what to do now. We shall we, Doomhammer announced calmly, both to them and to his own warriors. He set the head of his hammer on the ground and leaned on the long handle, alert but unconcerned. When they saw he was not attacking the creature, relaxed slightly, lowering their weapons as well. One even sprawled on the ground, though his eyes tracked the orcs' every movement. What are you called? I be good then, the creature replied. Ogrin Doomhammer. Doomhammer indicated himself with a thumb. And we are orcs of the Black Rock clan. What are your people? Where the forest draws, came the surprise answer, as if Cruel Tarn could not believe they did not know. A man it tried. Doomhammer nodded. Forest draws. And they had tribes, which meant they were civilized. Much, much more than ogres. For the first time, he found himself thinking, Black Hand's idea might be wise. These creatures seemed more like orcs than ogres. Despite their size and strength, what allies they would make. And they were native to this world, which meant they would know its geography, its inhabitants, and its dangers. An hour passed. Then, without warning, shadows separated from the trees and moved forward on a large, silent feet. 
becoming the troll who had left, and three others. Ya be one tin zuljin, one of them demanded, stepping close enough for Doomhammer to see the beads and bits of metal dangling from his long braids. Aya mir. Zuljin was even taller than the other trolls, and Lena, he wore some sort of heavy cloth wrapped around his waist, and groin, and an open vest of heavy leather. A thick scarf was worn about his neck and covered his face up to the nose, giving him a sinister appearance. This close doom hammer could also see that the troll's skin was furred. After a second, he realized it looked like moss. The trolls were green because they were covered in moss. What odd new creatures they were. I am Doomhammer, and yes, I will speak with you. Doomhammer looked up at the forest troll leader, refusing to show any fear. My leader, Blackhorn, rules the Orc Horde. No doubt you have seen our people move through the forest. Zul'jin nodded. We be seeing ya crashing through the trees, ya. You be clumsier than humans. He commented, stronger, though, in an arm for battle. What shall be wanting with us? Even behind the scarf, Doomhammer could see the troll grin, and it was not a pleasant expression. Ya want the forest, ya? Ya be fighting us for them, then. His hands dropped to his side and to the twin axes that hung there. And you will be losing. Doomhammer suspected the troll leader was right, too. The horde significantly outnumbered them, of course. But if all forest trolls were as strong and silent as these, they could strike from anywhere and disappear again. They could cut down any orcs entering this place, and the horde would not be able to move a large force through the trees to combat the attacks. Fortunately, that was not their goal. We do not want your forest, Doomhammer assured the troll leader. We want your strength. We plan to conquer this world, and we would have you beside us as allies. Zul'jin frowned. Allies? Why? What we gain? What would you want? One of the other trolls said something in a strange, hissing language, and Zul'jin cut him off with a sharp reply. We need nothing, ya, yeah, he answered finally, decisively. We have our forest. None dare intrude here, see if all the accursed elves, and those we be handling ourselves. Are you sure? Doomhammer asked, sensing a possible opening. These elves, they are a race unto themselves, a mighty one. Mighty, ya. Yeah. The troll agreed grudgingly. But we be killing them since ancient time. When they first came to this land, we needed no help from them. Why pick them off one by one, though? Doomham asked. Why not march on their homes and destroy them utterly? We could aid you with the horde behind you. You could crush the elves once and for all, and truly hold the force without contest. Zul'jin seemed to consider that, and for a moment, Doomhammer dared to hope the lean forest troll would agree, but finally he shook his head. We fight the elves ourselves, he explained. We needed no help. We're not wanting the rest of the world anymore, so fighting others will not be giving us anything. Doomhammer sighed. He could see the forest troll's mind was set, and he guessed that pushing the point would only antagonize him. I understand, he said at last. My leader will be disappointed as a mind. But I respect your decision. Zul'jin nodded. Go in peace, Orc, he whispered, already stepping backward toward the shadows. No troll will hinder you, ya. Yeah? And then he was gone, and the forest trolls with him. Blackhand had, indeed, been disappointed, and the war chief had bellowed at Doomhammer, and the others about failing their mission. But he had calmed down soon enough, and agreed with Doomhammer's own assessment that pushing the trolls might have made them enemies instead of neutral parties and that they did not wish to do. Doomhammer still regretted the troll's leader's decision, however, and he had instructed his scouts to watch for trolls any time they entered, or even passed near the forest. And now that watching had perhaps paid off, Doomhammer watched as the two boats beached upon the island's north shore. Rend leaped ashore at once, followed more slowly by a troll, whose hair was knotted in braids. A long scarf was wrapped around the troll's neck and lower face, and Doomhammer grinned with delight. It was Zul'jin himself. They were penned and chained, Rand reported, stopping only a few feet from where Doomhammer stood. The humans were careless, assuming the only threat in the forest was the one they had already captured. The Blacktooth grinned chieftain laughed. No one who saw us lived. Good. They watched as the troll leader approached. He looked the same as the last time they had met, and Doomhammer could tell from the troll's expression that he remembered the encounter as well. Your warrior saved us, the forest troll acknowledged. 
stepping up beside Doomhammer and giving him a nod, a greeting among equals. There were too many of them, ya, yeah, and you torture as the others at bay. Doomhammer nodded. I am pleased to aid a fellow warrior, he said. When I heard you had been captured, I sent my warriors at once. Zuljin grinned. Your leader be sending you? I am the leader now, Doomhammer replied, his own grin widening. The troll considered this. Your horde still seek and to conquer the world, ya? Yeah? He asked finally. Doomhammer nodded, not daring to speak. We be aiding you then, Zuljin announced after a moment. As you aided us, allies, he extended his hand. Allies. Doomhammer clasped it. His mind was already a whirl with possibilities. Between the trolls and the horde, and the new forces Zulahad was binding to the horde's will, nothing would stand in their way. End of chapter 4